the automated testing for ServiceNow uh, webinar. And today we're going to be talking about uh, automated testing, both on the ServiceNow platform uh, as well as off the platform, um, just really automated testing in general. So first off, a little bit uh, about myself as well as uh, Cerna Solutions, um, the, the organization I work with. Uh, Cerna Solutions, we provide consulting services and product solutions for ServiceNow. Uh, we specialize in ESM implementations, integration, security, and custom ServiceNow applications. Uh, as for myself, as I had mentioned, my name is Roger Enriquez. I'm an integrations architect uh, with Cerna. Uh, I'm also part of the product development team. Um, and I've actually been in the software development field for uh, <laughs> about a decade now. Um, and I initially started as a PHP developer. Um, and the needs of our organization changed, so I actually found myself working with the ServiceNow platform. Uh, then again, needs changed, and I started taking on some other projects um, that went outside of the scope of ServiceNow. Uh, so I started actually working on Python and Node.js. Um, then again, growing as an organization, we actually found ourselves back on platform. And uh, even more recently, I found myself actually uh, joining the Cerna team and working exclusively on the ServiceNow platform. Um, so, you know, as I went through and my roles and responsibilities changed, um, of course, there's going to be a little bit of a culture shock. When you're switching through languages, you know, the tooling is a lot of, uh, a little different here or there. Um, but one of the things that was probably the most impactful for me uh, was the fact that there was a lack of uh, testing uh, within, the, within the platform. Um, so not having that safety net was a bit of a shock for me. Um, so that actually led to the, the efforts that we had within Cerna, uh, specifically around Capio. And Capio is a automated testing solution that's actually built ex specifically for ServiceNow. Um, and, you know, one of, eventually, you know, you, you kind of get tired of the pain points, so you want to contribute. You want to make things better. Uh, so that's exactly where Capio came from. Uh, so today we're going to talk a little bit about automated testing. Um, it is about 30 minutes, so I think we'll kind of touch on a lot of subjects. Um, and of course, if you do have any questions, feel free to uh, ask them through the GoToMeeting um, or don't be bashful about shooting us an email. Um, maybe if you'd like to talk a little bit more in depth, we can absolutely do that. Um, so what are we gonna do today? Uh, basically what I would like to do is kind of talk about the past. Um, you know, what is common terminology used in automated testing? Uh, what are um, our, what were the, the options that we had available to us? And then shift gears a little bit more and talk about where are we today? Um, what are our options for organization uh, when we're doing testing? What are our options for actually completing testing, which unfortunately are still very limited? Uh, and then where do we go from here? Uh, where can we uh, take the next steps and work towards uh, possibly bringing automation, um, more, uh, more defined processes within our organization? Uh, and along the way, I will be mentioning some of the decisions we made when we were actually uh, building out the, the Capio product. Um, what were some of the the choices we made that actually influenced our development processes. Uh, so first off, terminology. Uh, let's make sure that we're all kind of speaking the same language. Uh, unit testing. When you're talking about unit testing, you're essentially talking about validation of a very, uh, a very small portion of your system. Um, and you wanna validate those on an individual basis, plus you wanna scrutinize them independently. Um, kind of throwing around some, some buzz terms there, but Either way, really what you wanna do is you just wanna really uh, narrow down the focus of your test to make sure that you're, um, you're very specific. Um, so for example, let's say we had a script include on the platform. If we could unit test that, we would wanna maybe validate a particular function, make sure that when we provide uh, a parameter of X that it should consistently and accurately uh, output Y. Um, then you have a little bit of a shift and that would become uh, functional testing. Now, functional testing, you're talking more about a, a complete system testing. Uh, we're not necessarily looking at the, um, the individual business rules or script includes. We're looking at things in a um, uh, kind of a more complete picture. Um, so for example, if I create an incident, assignment group should be automatically set with a status of open. Let's take a scenario like that. In order for you to do that, you're gonna to be touching on a lot of things. Um, you know, Maybe it's just solely a workflow with a handful of steps that need to kick off. You don't necessarily want to validate each step of the workflow. You kind of just want to see the, the end result. Um, then you get into regression testing. Now, regression testing really is, um, I, I guess, kind of a composition of like unit and functional testing. Could be a combination of both. But essentially there, what you want to do is validate that functionality that was previously working 
continues to work even after you've made changes to the system. Uh, and regression testing can actually be a huge safety net for you and your team. Um, innocently enough, you'll, you'll, you'll make a change and there's unintended consequences. That's why we have that safety net of regression testing. Um, so, you know, another, as a, as another example here, um, we take the previous example, we add that to our regression suite, which is our regression test. And then we execute that with every release to make sure that it never unintentionally breaks. Uh, then we have user acceptance testing. Folks love UAT, at least the phrase of UAT. Uh, UAT is something that would never actually be automated. Uh, that is a process that should always include actual users. Uh, you can do functional testing from an automated perspective because uh, it's easy for you to kind of have uh, expected results when you define your requirements beforehand. Uh, now, user acceptance testing, you're actually kind of validating the experience of the user. Um, if, the, in this instance, if an end user asks for a ticketing system that allows them to create tickets that they can work and track progress of, uh, very, very high level description, not too in depth with regard, uh, regarding the requirements. Uh, so that leaves a lot to be defined. So that's where you really need your use, uh, end users to jump in, use the system and feel like they're actually being productive on that system. Um, so the past. What do we have for testing? Uh, very limited to say the least. Uh, with regards to ServiceNow specifically, there's really not a whole lot, um, you know, but possibly some proofs of concepts that were built, uh, you know, internally to bring testing to the system. Uh, there's nothing that's native to ServiceNow. Um, and honestly, even if you did bring something that is, uh, you know, actually integrated into the system, that can kind of validate a couple of things that you would like. You would like to be able to uh, validate your system independent of the system. Um, so you don't necessarily want to have, um, I guess, productivity impacted by maybe minor outages or minor changes to the instance. If you can actually have that um, kicked off and being independent of your system, that just gives you that much more confidence in your testing. Uh, so shifting that, let's look at the present. Uh, where are we with regards to um, kind of the, the major pieces of validate, uh, sorry, of testing. First off, test plan organization. Uh, there's a couple of sides to that spectrum. Um, I, I'd love for it to kind of be a gray area, but a lot of the times it's just black or white. Um, on the, the organized side, you know, you'll have folks using the test management plugin. Um, that's within PPM. And that's actually a, a fantastic, uh, a fantastic module that's made available. You have access to your test plans. You have your, your test cases organized. Uh, the reporting is fantastic. Um, the fact that it's consolidated and you can have that historical uh, that's historical record of test running, it, it's great. It, everybody's in one location. Um, you, your tests are being run and you're seeing the most up-to-date information. Now, on the other side of that, uh, you have the not-so-organized. And unfortunately, you know, I've, I've been in quite a few organizations that use ServiceNow, and unfortunately, it's a very, very common way of doing it. Um, and we are looking at, you know, Excel sheets that are being sent back and forth via email. Um, hopefully that doesn't resonate with too many people, but that's definitely out there. So, so what are the issues with that? There's a lack of documentation. Uh, and when we say documentation, it's, it can span a lot of things. But specifically when we're talking about test cases, we're basically documenting what needs to happen with every major release or even minor releases. And if your documentation is not up to date, you're looking at missed tests. Um, so how do you solve that if you don't have organization? Unfortunately, that's knowledge silos. And when we say knowledge silos, we're basically talking about individuals. And those are those subject matter experts, people who know uh, a particular application within ServiceNow, top to bottom, inside and out. And unfortunately, those are the folks who are not allowed to take vacations. If you have a major release coming up, uh, there is no way you're taking that afternoon off, maybe even uh, ducking that on-call uh, pager. So that means no vacations for you. Um, and that's an unfortunate place to be in. Uh, now, there, there's also another item for developers. And this is always a, a peeve for developers on the platform, you know, myself included, which is scope creep. When you don't have your functionality uh, uh, consolidated, you don't have it clean, uh, you, you don't have it defined in a clean manner with test cases, what ends up happening is the last person to touch it has to make the their best assumption as far as what the stakeholders would like to see. Uh, so a very common scenario I've run into is uh, I will 
um, finish some functionality. I will you know, push that up to our next environment and we'll have our test user, uh, our, our tester start looking at it. Uh, then we know inevitably we get that feedback of, you know, when I submitted an incident, I'm assuming a notification would be emailed out, but I never got one. And the story fails testing. But the problem is we never really defined a requirement that said a notification needed to happen. Um, or maybe we define that requirement, but our team just doesn't necessarily feel like our test cases are organized or, uh, I hate to use the word, but credible. So when you show an error of organization um, and and basically process to your test cases, uh, that speaks volumes to the confidence that you user, users will have with the requirements that are given to them. And they make sure to do validations against the requirements, not necessarily how they would perceive the requirements to have been defined. Um, so shifting gears, moving away from organization, we have our test cases. Now, how do we run those test cases? And I'd say almost always it will be manual testing. Um, a handful of users who are the delegated manual testers. Um, and a big reason for that is because automation takes time. Um, automation, getting the infrastructure, getting the process put in place is not a trivial amount of work. Um, you know, we'll talk about this a little bit later of what our ideal state looks like. Uh, but keep in mind, you know, that's kind of the ideal state in my mind based upon my previous experiences. And I'm sure it would be a quite, uh, quite two months, if not a year of uh, work, figuring out what works best. Um, so yeah, so, so folks do not necessarily have the luxury of being able to move towards an automated system. So that's, uh, that's a very strong reason for why manual testing is so prevalent. Uh, but there's not without its downsides. Easy to start, but difficult to keep going. Uh, human error. The folks who are not taking vacations, you also can't make mistakes. So uh, there's kind of the assumption that, you know, never taking vacations, always working, always being on call uh, will not result in fatigue because we know that fatigue makes people make silly mistakes. Um, so obviously there's a problem with that logic. It's going to happen um, and hopefully it won't happen for a major bug that makes it to prod. Uh, second up, tunnel vision. When we are prepping for a release, we're almost always under the, watching the clock. Uh, so if we know that we have a limited amount of time to test, the conversation comes up of, okay, we know what we changed. What do we need to test? Uh, and that's a dangerous conversation to have because now we're talking about how can we, uh, remove, uh, some validations? How can we, um, hate to say it, but cut quality for time. Uh, and now we are psychic. We can say, okay, since we made changes to these things, these are all the things that could potentially break. Uh, but now we're put in the position where we are supposed to have the, that, that foreknowledge to know uh, this could potentially break, but I don't necessarily have the ability to prevent it from happening. Um, so that's, again, a, a little bit dangerous of a game to play when it comes to prod pushes. Uh, next up, testing takes a long time. Uh, as you're adding functionality to the platform, uh, it's inevitable that you are going to hit a critical point where your testing takes longer than for your development uh, team to actually churn out the functionality. Um, and that puts your testers in a very unfortunate situation. Um, you know, first off, as a stakeholder, you are having to communicate to your, um, uh, sorry, as a, as a business or as a manager, you have to communicate to your stakeholders that uh, it would take five weeks for you to deliver fairly straightforward functionality, even though you really know that it would take your devs maybe two weeks to get it done. Uh, but your testing is going to take three weeks if you're lucky. Uh, so that, that unfortunately puts your testers in an unfortunate, unfortunate situation because uh, now they're definitely going to be uh, feel compelled to, again, start making those, those trade-offs of do we deliver quality or do we deliver fast? Um, so, yeah, that, that, that's definitely a, a sad part of it. Now, the next part of it would be uh, it's expensive. Um, expensive both in time, money, and morale. Now, one of the problems here is when you are going through a test, um, a, you know, a, a test release, you can hit a major milestone and that's awesome. Uh, but if you happen to have a small hiccup, let's say um, you delivered a massive piece of functionality and that functionality was completed, but uh, the, a minor hiccup happened. Maybe a user is no longer able, uh, able to select a certain subcategory that they used to be able to. Um, a minor hiccup, something that could easily be fixed, but, you know, as you're having the postmortem and talking about the release, everybody's going to feel like there was a, a little bit of a black eye there. Um, even though we delivered a major milestone, uh, we had a minor, we had a minor issue. So don't do that to the morale. Um, 
you, if you can easily avoid those mistakes, go ahead and take some steps to do so. So future, let's say we want to move away from those things. We want to get better, organize, better organized. We want to uh, get uh, our manual testing kind of uh, under control. What should we do? Uh, let's try automation. So where can you get the highest ROI? Uh, and initially there will be a couple of options there. You could do unit testing or functional testing. Unit testing is great for developers. Uh, functional testing is definitely more uh, geared towards user experience and behavior validations. Uh, because ultimately, you know, what's going to define um, success for a release is whether or not your users enjoyed the release, whether or not they felt like it was delivered, um, delivered accurately. So even though we can maybe make some inroads on unit testing, ultimately you'll see the biggest return on ROI. Um, or sorry, highest ROI on user experience and behavior validation. And again, that's because if you are validating those things, you can ensure that you're not going to hit productivity uh, loss um, for a release that was um, uh, uh, pushed to prod. Uh, plus, it improves the credibility of the team. You never have to worry about end users realizing something went wrong. You know, it's one thing if folks use lose productivity. It's another one if maybe internally you realized, whoop, there's a minor bug here. Um, maybe something's not being calculated appropriately. Uh, we have a data issue on the back end. You know, we'll just kind of sweep those into the rug as technical debt and deal with that in a uh, in an upcoming release. Uh, now, the way to do that user experience and validation is going to be on a uh, a browser level. Uh, now, when you want to do that, that's going to require some kind of uh, automation. So that'll be some one of the pieces that we actually dig into a little bit more here. So, so what are the essential pieces to an automated, um, uh, an automated testing solution? Uh, that's going to be browser automation. Um, and we'll talk about some options there. Um, and really, we'll focus on one main one, which would be Selenium. Uh, next up, we talk test repository. Uh, we want to get a hold of that organization and make sure all of that is working smoothly and uh, everybody feels like they have the most up-to-date information. Uh, then last up, we'll talk about how do we actually run these things? How do we do our reporting? Um, and if we want to maybe put some shortcuts in place for us to be able to uh, write these things in a, a faster manner, uh, this would be where we would leverage that. So first off, Selenium. Uh, Selenium is extremely popular in automated testing. Uh, and since it's popular, you're gonna see a ton of implementations out there. Uh, Java, Node.js, Python. Um, you know, internally, we actually use Node.js. Um, WebDriver.io actually has a fantastic client for WebDriver. Uh, or sorry, for uh, Selenium. Um, and if you're looking at using that and you want to kind of stick in the JavaScript realm, I would suggest that one. Uh, but even though it is out there, it's not without its challenges. Um, and also specifically challenges around being used with ServiceNow. Uh, first off, maintenance for that and onboarding is not necessarily trivial. Um, when you're working through, you are uh, basically coupling yourself to the user interface of ServiceNow. And ServiceNow, as we all know, is a very innovative company. Uh, they're going to make changes. Um, for example, Fuji to Geneva was a huge jump. Uh, the user interface changed quite a bit. Now, when we are going through and updating our test cases in preparation for release, uh, that is a pretty good amount of time that's going to need to, uh, need to run. Um, and you are going to need to kind of know that from a technical um, perspective. So one of the things you can do uh, for the benefit of you and your group is uh, maybe make an abstraction on top of that. Not necessarily use native Selenium, but look at providing an API and maybe some shortcut commands. Um, and real briefly here, let me jump out and show you how we actually used it internally. Um, so hopefully everybody can still see my screen, but uh, here we actually, when we were building Capio, we knew that we wanted to make sure that it, it was able to, um, uh, able to live through maintenances and upgrades. So what we did is we actually put out the, the um, that, that API that I was kind of referring to, and it has a handful of commands, well, more than a handful, about 100 plus, uh, but those commands are ServiceNow specific. So you have expand application, select module, set field value. Uh, those all have behaviors that are specific to ServiceNow. When we talk of applications and modules, we're really just talking about the left-hand navigation. Uh, but when you write this test, you can write it in Fuji, um, and it has a certain behavior. If we upgrade the instance and move over to Geneva, we actually have one location where we need to be uh, to uh, we need to maintain those behaviors, so we can make this compatible with Geneva uh, without having to track down all of the locations in our test cases where that could be happening. Uh, so that would be one thing that I would absolutely suggest is make sure that you have 
uh, some kind of abstraction to make your maintenance easier as you go along. Uh, next up, when you are uh, when you are working with Selenium, there's definitely some technical aspects to it that we would need to be aware of, and we want to make sure that the uh, users we have are not uh, the the users and testers we have are not being left out of the loop. We want to continue to use those uh, those resources. So you know, if we're doing manual testing, we know that it's also uh, project managers who are jumping in on the test effort. Uh, we know that it's end users who are actually doing some early validations. So find a way for your non-technical members to be able to contribute. Uh, for example, uh, bringing up another item with Capio, when we were doing development, we actually got this feedback pretty early that there were concerns about, oh, uh, so how about uh, how technical do my folks need to be? Is it possible for folks who are not familiar with ServiceNow, or sorry, with uh, JavaScript to be able to write this? So what we did is we actually um, started working on a Chrome extension. Uh, and what you can do here is you can actually click on here and we start recording. Then as you are going through and navigating through the uh, through the platform, you know, for example, we do a search against this list field, um, we can go ahead and stop that. <clears throat> and here you actually see the resulting uh, script of that. So for example, we stepped through and we expanded our application, selected a module and did a search against the list. Uh, and this isn't, since we, did the before you know since we did the the pre-work to actually use uh, uh, an API and those commands this actually gets digested into something that's readable and easy to use uh, and that could just get copied and pasted over to a uh, a test case and now we actually have our non-technical users contributing to automation uh, so I would look at solutions like that to be able to make uh, to to make sure that your uh, non-technical users can continue to contribute uh, even beyond manual testing. Um, okay, so we have browser automation in place. We have an idea for that. Uh, up next is going to be the test repository. Um, so first off, you have a lot of options here. One of the critical things that I would put uh, that I would mention is you have an option of decentralized or centralized. Decentralized has its um, has its challenges. It's chaotic and can be difficult to track. Uh, so try to push for something more centralized. Um, for example, in Capio, we actually push that in platform. So all of your test cases, your plans. Uh, those are all housed within uh, the instance. Um, and since they're on the instance, we can actually kick those tests off from there. Uh, but we know that some folks might not go with the, the instance route. Uh, maybe they'd like to have it on a versioning system like Git or SVN. Um, either way, those are great because in a, you know, like specifically Git, although it's decentralized, at least you are centralized with regards to the repo. So push for that. Make sure that your folks are always looking at the, the latest version of your test cases. Make sure that um, uh, commits are always getting pushed up so everybody can benefit from those. So definitely go centralized. Regardless of the solution, just make sure it's all in one place. Uh, so next up, test runners. Now this is where we'll probably get a, a, a little bit more on the technical side with regards to what the requirements are here. Um, but the test runner, what we want to do is uh, have the execution of our test case originate from this server. Um, in addition to that, we also want those results to get pushed into the instance uh, or wherever you may happen to keep your reports uh, upon completion. Uh, now, one of, the, one of the strengths of this is it is something that resides outside of the platform. Uh, so that means we can we avoid a single point of failure and we also have a system independent of the, of the platform to help us validate the work we've done on the platform. Um, that's always fantastic. Testing is all about isolation and testing in isolation. So that, that's, a, that's a huge benefit to you. Uh, and then last, you have the freedom to select the tools that you like or that you would prefer and be able to fulfill your needs. Uh, for example, you know, a lot of folks actually use Firefox, but they want to maybe support Chrome down the road. Uh, since you have control of the test runner, you can actually es establish any number of browsers on that one uh, and be able to run your test, uh, your test cases using any number of browsers. So you can help ensure compatibility across multiples. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is since we're using Selenium, keep Selenium Grid in the back of your mind because that will facilitate that work a ridiculous amount. Um, so we have, you know, we talk about the runner, we know the requirements, why we need the runner. Uh, you essentially need something to kind of organize that and kick those off. So one of the first places you should go for that would be some kind of continuous integration uh, solution. Um, out of the bat, folks will prefer to do it locally just to kind of get them, themselves familiar and get their feet wet. Uh, but, you know, there's challenges there. Your test cases will be distributed. Uh, it's, it's very difficult for you to be able to uh, have consistent local environments. Uh, 
in addition to that, there's a lack of centralized reporting. You know, we have to trust that our users, once tests are complete, are going to uh, maybe go to a centralized location and push those reports up. So rather than doing that, um, you know, there's also the option of rolling your own. That's a pretty big time investment for something that exists out there. So don't recreate the wheel. Look at an existing solution. Um, specifically, you know, uh, Hudson and Jenkins. Those are continuous integration, um, you know, building platforms that uh, have been around for a very long time, um, way longer than I've been around <laughs> in the field. So look to those. Um, people are always establishing products for the latest and greatest technology. So uh, spend your time focusing on your process and delivering uh, automation rather than worrying about, you know, solutions that folks have already um, already fixed. So in addition to that, we want to talk reporting. When you do your reporting, there's a couple of necessary things there. You want to make sure you have your passes and failures. Uh, you want to make sure that you have descriptive errors when things go awry. Um, so for example, expected and actual results. And we have a little screenshot here of a report, but let me jump over and show you what that looks like within uh, Capio. And maybe that might be a little inspiration for folks. Uh, when you run your test cases, we provide uh, passes, failures, uh, number of tests, um, as well as the results of each one of those. Um, so this is kind of high level, but if you're looking at something more in depth, let's look at the individual validation. And in this case, we take the script, we, uh, you know, we, we copy that and keep it inside of the report. So we have the context of what was the state of our script when it ran, what were the expected and the actual results. Then in addition to that, we actually attach a screenshot, which this was based upon early feedback and has proven to be extremely invaluable. So while you're looking at your runners, Try to find one that can allow you to take screenshots upon failures. Um, so for example, we had an issue with our priority matrix here. Um, you know, I think we had the expectation that, uh, let's see, this should have been a three, but the actual value was a five. And we can confirm that with the screenshot. Uh, and that actually proves to be extremely valuable because that helps your confidence in the test cases that you have running. Uh, plus, you know, in a way, there's not a question again of, is the test acting weird or did we actually break something? Uh, you know the test is good, you see the screenshot, so you can actually uh, basically swivel around in the chair and ask the team, okay, who played with the matrix? Um, or did somebody change a requirement that I was unaware of? Uh, so when you're looking at that reporting, that would definitely be something that I would, uh, I would look into and make sure that um, you have as, uh, as much information, as much context is, uh, can be provided. Um, so yeah, so I kind of wanted to just do a quick overview uh, with regards to, to, to automation and some of the, the items that we had touched on uh, as we were going through with Capio. Um, so one thing I would ask is if folks are interested and they would like to see automation within their organization, uh, jump over to our Cernus Solutions site. And on there, we have a demo for Capio. Um, I think it's about uh, five minutes or so um, and goes through a lot of the functionality I had talked uh, through uh, a little more in depth. Um, and if you like what you see and it's something that you really think uh, could help you in your organization, um, I would definitely reach out and uh, we can set up a call, maybe talk a little bit more about how you and your organization um, are, are hoping to use automation uh, as well as maybe how uh, Capio can help you. Um, you know, we touched through these things pretty quickly, uh, but you know, the, e even though we touched on them quickly, we know that there's a lot of time and a lot of effort that's necessary. Um, so if, you know, realistically you feel like, uh, you and your team may not necessarily have time to, uh, roll your own solution and you'd prefer something turnkey, uh, we can definitely talk about Capio, uh, being there to help you out. Uh, so yeah, with that, um, we can go ahead and open it up for questions and I'll go ahead and look here to see what we have. Uh, okay, so first question would be, will this be recorded and viewable afterwards? Absolutely. Uh, we've been recording since the beginning, so we will make this available, I believe, on our Cerner Solutions site um, for um, folks who may not have been able to attend, uh, as well as those who um, would just like to, to take a look. Maybe, a, you know, maybe you have a coworker who might be interested. Feel free to pass this along. Uh, let's see. So we have a question about how do I calculate ROI for automated testing versus manual? Uh, and how can I show this value to my superiors? Uh, that's a great question. And that's actually one that we've been working on internally. Um, what I would suggest is actually reach out to us. Uh, we do have a spreadsheet that uh, takes into account a lot of your current expenses uh, within your organization with regards to manual testing. 
Uh, plus, we also look at costs for getting automated testing set up as well as dealing with the maintenance ongoing. Um, so if you would like to do that and you'd like to, to get a better idea of what the ROI would look like, uh, definitely reach out to us and uh, uh, one of our guys would definitely be happy to help you out there. Uh, let's see, is there a solution other than Selenium? Uh, I'm sure there are quite a few out there. Uh, realistically, uh, I think they're, yeah, that's a good one. Um, realistically, I think there are, anybody may uh, actually have a different implementation um, that's essentially just an abstraction of Selenium. Um, I tend to prefer just having something that's as close to native as possible. Uh, mostly because you can you can avoid that that overhead uh, that unnecessary overhead, where if you are building your own dialect, uh, that's great because that's a dialect that you and your team are familiar with. You don't necessarily need to know um, kind of a more generalized um, syntax and language. Um, you can just build it basically purpose built for for Selenium or sorry for ServiceNow. Um, uh, but yeah, for the most part, I think those are kind of the standards, uh, which would be Selenium. And, and sorry, hopefully I answered that one uh, to, your, to your satisfaction. Uh, let's see. Okay, does Capio automatically account for varying delays between button clicks and page changes? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, and we actually went through a lot of time trying to figure out exactly how to do that. Um, and I guess to kind of provide a little peek behind the curtain, uh, one of the things we did with Capio is we actually keep an eye out for anchors. Um, anchors on the page that are actually uh, very useful for defining whether or not a, uh, a page has completely loaded. Um, so that would be one thing that I would suggest is within Selenium, there's actually a wait for command um, and, and definitely within WebDriver IO. Uh, and what you can do is actually kick off, your, um, kick off your changes, but try to keep an eye out for an anchor and essentially have Selenium hold until that anchor is, uh, and I kind of refer to it as anchor, but um, uh, an element on the page that you know needs to be there. Um, and fortunately, wait for has a timeout too. So if you want to have some kind of red flags with regards to duration, for example, if you submit an incident, uh, but the page hasn't loaded for uh, a few seconds, you can go ahead and set that up as a red flag, maybe in, even a failure. Uh, let's see here. Um, so there was a question about uh, pricing and possible evaluation. Uh, absolutely. Uh, again, I would reach out to Cerna Solutions. Um, one of our folks could uh, talk a little bit more about uh, about the uh, licensing and pricing structure of that. Uh, and then, of course, an evaluation as well. Um, that's definitely a critical piece. Folks want to get their hands on it and take a look. So uh, feel free to to reach out. Uh, and I do want to be whoops. And I do want to be aware of folks' time. So uh, I'll answer a couple of more questions and then. Uh, if we don't get to it, I'll be sure to reach out to you via email um, and get responses to those questions. If anything, maybe I will uh, reach out internally to, to our operations folks and see maybe if we can get a little Q&A session set up uh, on one of our Cerna Solutions sites. Uh, so everybody will get the benefit of those answers. Uh, so let's see here. Okay, so uh, how would we use that on a QA and a development system? Are tests made on both systems or only one of them? Uh, that's a great question and a huge, um, uh, a huge influence in the way that we actually built out our solution. Ideally, what I would say is keep your test cases in one location uh, and write things based upon, I guess you would say the test plan, not necessarily the environment you're writing for. Um, so for example, if you have a new functionality that's coming out, uh, go ahead and put a test plan, plan in place with the associated test cases to validate that functionality. Um, now, what we do within Capio is you actually have the ability to build out a test plan, but point that at a particular environment. So when you kick it off from your, um, from your, your single instance, you can hit your dev, you can hit your QA, you can hit your prod, which basically means you can go through a software development flow of go to development, go to QA, and then write against prod, or sorry, uh, run against prod. Um, so yeah, so I, I would uh, I would definitely suggest uh, make your test plans configurable in a way where you can change the endpoint. Um, one of the upgrade workflows that I like is if you would like to move to the next version, maybe clone your prod, set that up as a sandbox, and then run your test cases against that just to get an idea of whether or not you're, you're in for some trouble when you go to the next version. Um, 
so yeah, so so with that, uh, I think we'll probably stop the questions here. Uh, sorry to cut folks off. I do want to uh, not run over too long. I think we're about seven minutes over now. Um, so if you do have some questions in here, um, definitely feel free to continue sending them. Uh, but other than that, we will go ahead and respond via email uh, and maybe send an update uh, if we do get a chance to uh, open up a little bit more of a, a Q&A session. Uh, so with that, thank you all very much for attending the webinar. Um, I hope it was informative. Uh, I hope it will uh, kick off some internal conversations about getting automation started within your org. Um, and if you do have any questions or would like to dig, a, uh, dig in a little more, again, reach out. We'll be more than happy to answer. Thank you very much. Take care.